Welcome to Sparring Session. I'm George Jakovic alongside the champs, Chris Algieri and Pauli Malinaji. Sparring Session, we've got six three-minute six three minute rounds, six topics. The champs are going to go at it. They're going to discuss, debate. They're going to spar. One thing a little different about this one, they're going to be scored. I know you don't usually score sparring rounds. We're going to score these guys and see who comes up with the best argument. So our first five rounds, round one is going to be Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford. Will it live up to the hype? Round two, Paulie's good friend, Adrian Broner. Will he ever become a champion? Round three, the boxing organizations, good or bad for the fighters. Round four, Paulie, I have a lot to say about this. Best trash talker of all time. Round five is Tim Zua threat to Jamel Charlo. And we have a special round six surprise for the guys. All right, guys. This is sparring session, so we encourage you to talk. But please, when the, be when the bell rings, you got to cut it off. So round one, we're going to start with Paulie, since Paulie's on the left. And the topic is Errol Spence and Terrence Crawford. Will it live up to the hype? Guys, there's a lot of hype. I mean, they're scoring the press conferences already. So let's ring the bell. Round one, Paulie, is this fight going to live up to the hype? While I, I prefer guys to fight in their primes because the, of their inner ferocity is much more at a high level when you're at fighting in your prime. There's much more to fight for. Your, your legacy is still on the line. I think at this point, both these guys' legacies are pretty secure, but who will be the best of their era? I think these guys are competitive enough that even past their prime, past their best years, I think this fight will live up to the hype. Not just because I think the action lives up to it, but also because I think they're a bit hungrier in terms of creating their legacy than some, older, some of the older fighters of the past you know i think these guys are really going to go at it i think they have a friendly respect for each other but at the same time legacy is so important to both of these guys that i think you're going to see the ferocity in this fight even at their bit of an advanced age i like the style matchup it's it's Errol is going to bring an engine. Errol's depending always on bringing an engine. So he's going to make a fight regardless, and that's always going to be exciting. But this time, he's got a guy in front of him who can be a foil. He knows how to switch stances. He knows how to box from both stances. And I think that can cause a little bit of confusion, enough to slow down the pressure of Spence. And if it does, you start to have a different kind of fight. I think ultimately, both guys have so much on the line that this fight certainly lives up to the hype. And I think both of these guys will be proud of their performances. And, people, and fans will enjoy it. I, I can't disagree. I, I think this is a great fight. I, I love the matchup. I actually think that it, it's it's a more competitive fight now because they are a little bit over the hump, over the hill between, uh, you know, Terrence Crawford being a little bit older now. He's he's he's, a, he's 35 years old. Spence on the on the tail end of, of two serious car accidents and a torn retina. I, I think a couple years ago when Terrence was getting used to the welterweight waters, I think Spence was was going to be the winner all day long. I think he was too big, too strong, too too accustomed to the weight. He was having great momentum. But now, as as Terrence has grown into the weight class, he's a true welterweight now. I heard he walks around 175, 180 pounds, which is what welterweights in the common in the in modern era do walk around like. I think he's a real welterweight. And like I said, because Spence has has had those few car accidents where he physically could be in a little bit of a decline, I think the fight is a, literally a match a 50-50 a matchup. It can go either way. Now, one thing that could be an issue, I've seen these guys at the press conferences, there's a lot of respect, maybe too much. There's a little bit of trash talk here and there, but if those guys go into the, um, into the ring on fight night with that level of respect, we could end up not having the bar burner that everyone suspects we could have. I'll tell you what, I, I, Mayweather and Pacquiao didn't have a ton of respect for each other, and their fight ended up being kind of a dud. I don't really mind the respect here in this fight uh, because I can see I, between the lines, I'm reading that they're ultra competitive. You know, I've spoken to both guys about this fight, uh, not in detail, but, you know, in, subtly. And both of these guys have always really, really had it out for each other as far as from, from a competitive standpoint, at least for as long as this fight has been being discussed. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I spoke to Crawford after the Avenesian fight, he was actually more motivated about the fact that I pick against him in the fight. He said, you know, it's guys like you that really motivate me to want to make sure I want to win this fight so I can prove guys like you wrong. And he didn't say it in a disrespectful way. He just he's such an ultra competitive guy. And for me also, I, I know how much being the best of his era, it means everything to Errol. So despite the respect, I mean, they respect ding, ding. each other from a, from a boxing perspective, but they really, really will go at it. All right, guys. That's the end of the first round. Paulie, got to give you a warning, warning there. You talked a little after the bell. That's your first warning. I know it's tough. But uh, you you both bring up great points. Uh, you you agreed on this. I I learned something listening to both of you. I'm sorry. I gotta go. Uh, I gotta go. Ten ten on that round. So first round, it's ten ten. Round two. 
Polly, we're going to start with you on this one. Again, I'm sorry, Chris. But the topic is Adrian Broner. He just had a fight. He beat up uh, a lawyer. He's moving down to 140. The topic is Adrian Broner. Will he ever become a champion again? Ring the bell. Polly, start us off. I think under the right circumstances, Adrian can become a champion again. It depends on how hungry he is and also if you end up getting the kind of champion that it's, it become, and it's beatable, you know? I think 140 pounds right now is a very deep stacked weight class. But at, the, at, at day's end, if you get a hungry Adrian Broner, uh, let's say you can, you put him up against a Rolly Romero, which is a good fight, and you really have a hard time picking it. I don't think you would favor Broner against any of the champions right now. But I, I think there's also guys that he can be competitive against. Where if Broner can raise his level just a little bit higher to where, where – anywhere close to where he used to be before, I think he may be able to get wins over possibly a Rolly Romero or even basically the way we saw Regis Pro Ray just look. I mean, Pro Ray looked very, very beatable as well over the weekend. So I think under the right circumstances, Broner can win a world title. I certainly think the circumstances are right for him to at least make a run at it. Whether he wins it or not, ultimately will still be entertaining because Broner is personality, Broner is style, and Broner is just the guy people will always talk about when he's involved in the mix. And so keeping him in the mix, I think, is just good for boxing in general. But ultimately, I think the possibility is there. It won't be easy. And uh, I, you can't say for sure, but I think he can at least make a run at it. Absolutely not. He is not going to be a world champion again, even if he were to get a title shot, which would be ridiculous on its face. He doesn't beat any of those guys. I don't think he beats the next level guy. I don't think he beats anybody in the top 10 at 140. Yeah, Prograde didn't look great this past weekend. He didn't throw a lot of punches. You put those two guys in the ring together, they what what did they land? Uh, 80, 80 something punches in the fight on the Saturday night. You put Broner and Prograde in the ring, they're going to land eight punches. They, like, Broner doesn't throw punches anymore. He stands in front and just, you know, he's tough, he's durable, he takes shots. He went 12 with Pacquiao, but he just, he just he doesn't have that fire. He doesn't have that will. He doesn't have that drive. Super talented guy, absolutely. But like he's 32 going on 62 the way he fights. I, I can't see him beating any of those guys at 140. These kids are too young, too hungry, and they got way too much to lose. And and with him, I don't know, man. I, I really do think that he is a, an old 32. Again, I, 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 I'm I inclined to agree in some spots, but again, I'm, I'm trying to see if Broner has it in him to dig down just a little bit. Broner was never the most active guy in terms of throwing punches, but he did physically pressure you in terms of he would cut off the ring and bring it to you even without moving his hands. And it would make you sort of panic and make you want to throw more punches. It would sort of make you punch yourself out. It would force mistakes. I think him taking it to Pro Gray, who's not really an active guy, would force Pro Gray to fight. And it would possibly force Broner to fight at least a little bit more. And we could see in a fight like that how hungry he is. Rolly Romero so awkward, but defensively, he makes such awkward defensive moves that, that Broner could make him pay with that mental pressure as well. Listen, doesn't mean Rolly won't land as well because again, Broner, because he's not active enough, puts himself in positions to be hit or at least contact be made on him. I'm saying ultimately it can be entertaining. Whether he can definitely win or not, we can't say for sure. But I don't think it's out of the question that Broner should at least be in some of these fights and be entertaining in the process because the press conferences will be, I mean, Broly and, and Broner. Well, Broly, that, that, that's, that's, that's how I can see it happening. But even with Roly, he would be the only guy, that would be the only way he would be able to get to, to that, that bell. But I don't think he beats him either. He just is not active enough. Yeah, I mean, again, wow. I can't say that's for the sure, bell. But I think that's the bell. That's the bell. And, and Paul, I timed Paul, that perfectly. I timed that perfectly. <laughs> you, well, you had to because Paulie took a lot of time. I know. Listen, I know. Uh, I'm I'm the judge. Ultimately, you guys made great points. Um, Chris, you 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 swayed me. I mean, I think there could be a chance. I I thought going in because of the way Progray looked and uh, Roley is is a wild card. But Chris, ten nine for you that round. I, I I'm inclined to agree with you. I don't think Broner <laughs> is ever is ever going to win a title again. So we got two rounds in the books. We got round three. This is coming from an Errol Spence quote. He spoke at the end of one of the press conferences, and he questioned the boxing organizations. Um, where does the money go that they get? Um, does it go to the fighters? Is there any accountability? So round three, we're going to start with you, Chris, to be fair. The boxing organizations, are they good or bad for the fighters? Ring the bell for round three. I'm going to pick a third option. They're terrible. They don't do anything. That money is 3% of a purse. And we're talking about guys making big, big money. I remember cutting those checks and being sick over how big the check was for, for my world title fights. I mean, both sides pay, by the way. It's not just the champion. The other guy, whoever's, the, whoever's fighting for the title also has to pay that 3%. That's a ton of money that, that these organizations are getting. And what are they doing with it? Throwing extravagant parties once a year where they have their meetings and, and 
you got promoters trying to get their guys up to by probably paying things off as well. It's just, it's just, it's a, it's a big money grab. I, I don't see how it, how it helps the fighters. Sure. Having a title helps a fighter has or helps their earning potential helps their status. It's important to have a belt. The belts are important, but the organization should not be taking money out of fighters pockets. And, and, and again, where does that money go? You're, you're taking three percent out of somebody's purse, and then how many fighters do we have? Champions, ex-champions who are destitute in their in their in their later years because of stuff like that, money like that. And well, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna let Paulie come, and then I'm gonna have more comments. But yeah, I'll say this. I'm gonna be respectful of your time. I'll, I'll say this: extortion <laughs> is part of life, I guess. You know, I, I really don't agree with the extortion fees, that, uh, especially once the purses are so high. But I'll say this. Pay for play is part of life. It's talked about in politics as well. Uh, it happens, even though it's not supposed to happen. It constantly happens, and this is sort of a pay for play. You know, you're paying you're paying the extortion fee in order to get that world title, and you kind of need for for sanctioning bodies in this day and age because fighters don't fight often enough. You talk about in the fifties, people talk about oh, in the days of the one champion era. Well, the one champion era, the fighters fought every month. You know, so you'd have top contenders constantly getting title shots at the boats, and now. Champions fight twice a year at most, and you'll have a lot of top guys not getting a title shot if you only had one belt. So you kind of need four major sanctioning bodies to have four major world titles. Here's the problem, though. These guys start making a million other subtitles, you know, the secondary world titles and even continental, regional, and all kinds of titles, and they're collecting the same 3% sanctioning fees for all those titles. Now, they're less pur the purses are less for those fights, but again, this all adds up. Not enough is going back into boxing. It's going into their own pockets, and that's the problem. I, ha I don't have a problem with the four sanctioning bodies itself themselves existing if they do things right but then they start to take advantage a good thing and this is four sanctioning bodies from here are a good thing with the schedules that fighters have today but a too much of a good thing can always be bad and for me that's why it's bad yeah i like i said i agree that there should be titles the more time i don't think it, i don't have a problem with there being so many titles it's just it's, it's the money the money really burns me so the, the yokozuna which is the, uh, the sumo title when you're a yokozuna you get paid monthly by them by the organization where's the money going for the for the for for in boxing a, a, a champion should be getting paid by the organization honestly they're representing the organization not the other way around why am i paying your bills you should be paying my bills i i represent you i i, I am i am the face of what your what your your promotion is i'm wearing your title belt so i, I don't like the idea of of this money that goes nowhere we have no and there's no way to to, to track it either and, and and my biggest my biggest problem is the the lack of money going into drug testing. With all this money yes. they make, they can easily yes. drug test strictly, consistently all year round, and they don't. Great point. The challengers have to pay that sanctioning fee too. Am I right? Yes. Yeah, Chris said that. Yeah, because because if they don't, they they can't win the title even if they win the fight. If you don't pay the gotcha. sanctioning fee before the fight, you, you the title won't be on the line for you. All right. Well, guys, that, that has to be a 10-10 round. You guys were, were were on point with everything. I mean, it was solid, uh, and I couldn't agree more with all your points. Round four, the topic is, who is the best trash talker, not of just now, but of all time? And Chris, we'll start with you to let you get two rounds in a row. Start the bell, best trash talker of all times. Man, I'm trying to I mean, Broner was pretty good. I really, the can man anybody can get it mexican that 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 always that always got a giggle out of me um i know that's gonna that's gonna burn paul because he, he had trash truck with him <laughs> and their fight it was it was good it was it, that was one of the best back and forths i've ever seen um but he i mean he was consistently a good trash talker everybody he fought he always had things to say even later in his career when he didn't have really like great performances he still talked a lot of trash like when he fought pacquiao you know, who you can't talk trash to because the guy literally is one of the nicest people in the world outside of the ring. He just shrugs your shoulders like, I'm, OK, I don't you know, whatever. Um, but Broner was still still out there, you know, talking trash, even after the fight where he's when he said that he thought he won, which is absolutely insane. Um, and he was still talking trash and it, it always gets a giggle out of me. And with Rolly Romero, I just think he's so nonsensical and I can't see him being, you know, one of one of the top guys. But it is it is entertaining and it, it does get a lot of eyes. Um, yeah, I guess I guess I go with Broner. I can't really think. I'm trying to think of guys in in past years, but I don't know. That's kind of like a new age thing. Not a lot of trash talk back in the day. I, I, I think the yeah. I, I think in this era, the in this generation, the best trash talker is Adrian Broner. But I think of all times, we have to go to the the founder, the founder of trash talking, Muhammad Ali. I think Muhammad Ali is the possibly yeah. the best trash talker ever. Uh, he he sort of started the trash talk. If you remember boxing, you look at all boxing the way the interviews went before that. They guys were confident. I can remember Carmen Basilio saying nine when he was told nine out of ten of boxing experts picked against him in the Sugar Ray Robinson fight. He said nine of them were wrong, but that was that way, they, they, which was a great 
one one liner. But ultimately, Muhammad Ali would just give guys nicknames. He's the first guy to really insult you and make it personal, all this other stuff. I mean, it was something new and it was something extravagant. But look how much it sold him. He started. He took something that hadn't been done and brought it to another level. And he was witty enough and creative enough to do it. I I, I do like the Broner situation because. Broner makes you think. He's so witty on the spot. As a matter of fact, up until yesterday, he's, he's trash talking Regis program for Father's Day. You know what I'm saying? If you look at his Instagram post, he's post, <laughs> he's he's giving a backhanded compliment to Regis program on the Father's Day post. I mean, he's still going. That Broner, he can be, he can become a mid tier fighter and still be entertaining because of his trash talk. He's the only guy that really, really could make me really, really think about what kind of trash talk I had to do and, and really brought me to an extreme level. He made me realize how good of a trash talker I could be. Because when you don't have guys coming back at you, it's really not that good of a trash talker. Like Mayweather's a trash talker, but if you put him on the spot, the McGregor press conference showed that Mayweather couldn't be that witty on the spot. Broner's witty on the spot, man, and he forces you to be witty on the spot. And at how much of a good trash talker do you have to be to make a 13-to-1 odds fight, which is me versus Broner, and make it the most watched fight of the year that year in boxing? I mean, people 13 to 1 fights aren't don't become the most watched the, uh, boxing event of the year. Me, me and Broner, that trash talk became it made that fight the most watched boxing event of 2013 uh, outside of Mayweather paper. I didn't think we were going to agree on this one, but yeah, I, I mean Broner's fun. It's very he's very funny. Yeah. That's a, that's our round guys. Uh round 4 is in the books and boy Paulie is is slightly behind on my scorecard. He had a huge round 4. I mean, Chris I was expecting, it was almost a layup. I was expecting Ali first, but Paulie going to Muhammad Ali, that's a 10-8 round. Chris, you got dropped in that round. It's only the fourth round, though, so that's a 10-8 round for Paulie. Round five, Tim Zhu just had a fight over the weekend. He blitzed Carlos Ocampo in one, one round. Uh, Paulie, we're going to start with you. The topic is Tim Zhu. Is he now a real threat to Jamel Charlo for supremacy at 154? Start the bell. Paulie, we go to you first. I think Jamel Charlo is the favorite against any 154 pounder right now. But Tim Zhu is starting to look like the goods each and every fight. I can't say that just because of the Ocampo fight, Tim Zhu raises his game. Because let's face it, Ocampo has had two Showtime main events in his career. Both He's been stopped in one round both times. The first one was years ago I, when I was still working at Showtime when Errol Spence stopped him. So I'm not going to say for the reason of Ocampo, of the stoppage here, that he's a, a, a threat to Jamel Charlo. But I think the consistency in the body of work makes him a big threat. He's hungry. He's new on the scene. He's got the pedigree. And, and the DNA that he's got to live up to, which also puts pressure on him. You can see he enjoys himself and he wants, and he, and he really is enjoying the ride up the ladder. And now it's kind of become personal with the way Jamel has made the trash talk. Zoo said something very key and interesting uh, before, uh, after the win over the weekend. He said, not only is he hungry for the undisputed title, but he wants the Jamel Charlo's name specifically on his resume. So Jamel having made it personal, Tim making it personal now, returning fire, I, and also the skill set that Tim is starting to show, I think he is the main threat to Jamel Charlo for sure. Jamel Charlo, I will say, has, has got a terrific boxing resume so to be a legitimate threat to Jamel Charlo you've got to be the goods I think Zoo is a threat but you cannot say Zoo is actually a favorite against Jamel and the, with the kind of resume Jamel has developed he's one of the champions that has one of the better resumes in boxing yeah I mean I, I think Zoo is the real deal I've been saying that for a while now I think with the uh, Terrell Gaucha fight um, he had to get up off the deck early on I think that only helped him in his confidence and then the Tony Harrison win, which is his biggest to date by far, the way he was able to dismantle him and get him out of there. Uh, he looked fantastic that night against his, his toughest opponent and a guy who actually holds a win over Jamel. I mean, granted, it was, it was much later, and, um, you know, and it, you can't just do boxing math that way. It's like, oh, he beat him, I beat him. But, you know, and then Jamel also came back to knock out Tony Harrison when they, in their rematch. But, no, I, I think Tim Zhu is the good. I, he's one of the best fighters I've seen technically come out of Australia um, pretty much since his dad. I mean, he's he's very, very strong. He's very young. He's got momentum, too. Well, or, or, what, what worries me about Jamel is the inactivity. Champions who are inactive, it's, it's very, very hard to find that rhythm and get into a big fight against a young, hungry guy like Zhu, who, and now we're seeing, we're seeing it in the way he's talking, super confident because he believes in his skill set and because his recent outings in the ring have been better and better and better. Yeah, Ocampo, if he didn't starch him in one round, it would, it would actually be negative. So the, the fight didn't necessarily make him... Uh, um, you know, elevate him because of what how, how it ended. But if it had, it had gone a different way, I would have more question marks. I think Tim Zeus for real. 
I, I, I'll say, I'll close with this. I, the first time I saw Tim Zhu a few years back, I, people can look back at my old tweets. I said, he's going to go down as the best boxer Australia has ever produced. I still believe that. Uh, I don't believe his father counts as Australian because his father was born in Russia, even though he fought out of Australia. But Tim Zhu is going to become the best Australian born fighter ever, in my opinion. But He's got a tough task in front of him in terms of uh, with Jamel Charlo. Jamel Charlo is no easy, he's no easy pick, no easy guy to on the throne for the world title. But if he's able to beat Jamel Charlo, he really goes on his way because this is not an easy task against the undefeated champion. That's our bell and Paulie. Gonna give you a second warning. Talking, talking after the bell. That's two, Paulie. Take a point. Um, Take a point. <laughs> uh, um, hey, listen, listen now, Jerry. Pipe down. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm the judge here. I'm the rep. We and the let, judge. I'm, we're gonna let him do it every round. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but that's two warnings, Paulie. So I got again. These are these are tough rounds to score. Um, but Chris, I, I'm gonna give you the slight, slight edge in that round. Ten nine. Please don't question my scoring because I am the ref and the judge. So round six, and, and Paulie, we'll start with you. Uh, we talk about the lightweights all the time, and this is something that I've talked with the two of you off camera, and I know you have a lot of opinions. Round six, the topic is, and we'll start with you, Paulie, who was the greatest lightweight of all times? Ooh. Ring the bell. Paulie, start us off. Interesting round. This, this is a big debate here. The, the question is always between Whitaker and Durant, typically. I know Mayweather had a little bit of a run in lightweight and did very well. For me, Pernod Whitaker is the best lightweight ever. Uh, I, and the reason I pick him over Durant is when I see Durant against the style of, of Whitaker, like a slickster, a guy who's really a, a, a boxer who can confuse you and slick defensive guy, I see that Durant had issues. Yes, he got in Ray Leonard's head and made the, Leonard fight the wrong fight. But again, he needed to psychologically beat Leonard in order to do that. If you look at the way Leonard boxed in the rematch, very, very slick very very smart Durant was completely frustrated I add into this uh, into this factor the Wilfred Benitez fight Benitez completely bamboozled Durant with his slick style intelligent boxing uh defensive radar style technique Durant was a machista he was a macho guy he loved to draw you into a tough fight and then he was able to be more crafty than you in that kind of fight but if he couldn't draw you into that kind of fight where he where where you came out of pocket and became a little bit more active and trying to engage with him he couldn't really be out crafty you if you were a crafty fighter like a Benitez or like a Leonard once he couldn't draw those kind of guys into those kind of fights he was completely bamboozled so for me when I add all that into into, into position I look at Whitaker as having that kind of style and he's one of the best ever at that kind of style and for me uh, Perno Whitaker is the best lightweight ever all right, finally, we have a fight because I got Durant. I think Durant is the best lightweight ever. I just think stylistically, it's a great matchup. It's an awesome, awesome fight. Um, now, is the fight fought in 12 rounds or 15? If it's 15, I got Durant, no problem. Absolutely controls, you know, wins that fight. 12 rounds is, is definitely closer, but I still go with Durant because Durant, which people don't give him credit for, was, was defensively very, very sound and extremely tricky with his inside fighting. You know, obviously, we know Pernell Whitaker has a fantastic defense, changes levels, gets really, really low. But, but Duran was so rough. If 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 Pernell was getting to get super low like that, Duran would just drop his weight on him, elbow him in the back of the head, push him down, hit him while he's that low. He can't defend against a guy like Duran who's so physical when he, when he gets that close. He would have to get his respect early, too, because, I mean, J Pernell definitely wasn't a puncher, and Duran had... Honestly, I mean, the guy, the guy was known for having big power. And he'd hit you on the elbows, he'd hit you on the shoulders, he'll hit you on the thigh, he'll hit you on the cup. I just think stylistically the matchup, which would be a brilliant one, I think Duran is just, it was tricky enough. And when, when you said about the Benitez fight, that was a 47. That wasn't his natural weight. I know he fought all the way as high as 60, 68, but that's just because he was so damn good. And his defense was that good, that he could fight in those higher weight classes. So, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely disagreeing with this. I'm going, I'm going Roberto Duran all, all day. Well, those 47 pounds are with, with, with Benitez, the weight didn't really come into factor. Again, it's a psychological battle. Duran would get bamboozled with slick fighters. He'd be really confused. He wasn't able to pressure you the way he wanted to because I, once he was confused, his pressure would start to diminish a little bit and he'd be trying to figure out answers first. So once you start the bamboozle... Yeah, but a lot of that's because of the height stuff, and reach. He didn't... He, stuff, he wasn't... Yeah, he wasn't he, he had 66-inch arms. All of this stuff with that's the elbows. That's short, guys. Look, look sure. at the rematch with Durant with Leonard. Is, is, with the clock up? No, all this... All the this clock stuff is with up. Leonard. Oh, all right. <laughs> take a point. A <laughs> take little, a best uh, well, three in well, a row. Chris, I was about to take a point, but you jumped in there too, and you guys <sighs> both went back and forth. Well, so. he's, he's 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 pushing me to to to, to cheat back. I can't. <laughs> it's good. I can't it's even have the bell and me not swing back. Now. Chris, you got to rise above. Rise above it. It's um, a fight, bro. <laughs> wow, that was uh, 
what a what a debate you know most people say duran but i i grew up with whitaker like he was a, a fighter from my childhood so i've got i've got strong feelings on both guys i'm sorry but i'm going 10 10 on that one i mean oh, man, i thought, I, thought I was gonna get that shots. one ah, and, and chris you, you 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 blew it when you jumped in because i was about to take a point off and you, you jumped see? right back in i'm, too, I'm filing see? a protest I'm filing well, a protest with the commissioner. See, on this one. Maybe I should have said. Maybe I should have said this guy's the best trash talker because now he's got me acting out of pocket. God damn maybe. it! Maybe. <laughs> but I, listen, after six rounds, I've got it all even. So our our, our first sparring session together, the champs are even. Uh, Paulie had a big, big, big fourth round. He had a 10-8 round, and he was on the verge of getting a point taken off. But Chris Algieri, just usually a gentleman. Just wasn't a gentleman at the end of the fight, and but you have to fight fire with fire. So, yeah. so that I'm not was one to push it. around. So you know, I gotta... <laughs> that was it, guys. Uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, listen, everyone, please subscribe, yeah. comment on these shows. It's so easy to comment, and, and it's called your boxing channel. We want to get you involved. We want you to pick topics. We want you to critique these guys. We want to build shows around what you guys have to say. So, uh, champs. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for going six rounds today, six six hard rounds. Paulie just watched after the bell. And thanks for joining us on Sparring Session. We'll be back soon. Pro Box TV is your boxing channel.